Charlie mentioned several times, well, the real inflation number, it's like something something ridiculous. You know, we got 9.1%. It's probably double that. I, I told you all that yesterday. I told you that the day before. So I decided that we should take a little bit of a dive into this and what exactly happened, because it is the case that the way that we calculate our inflation has changed. It especially changed in the 90s. And if you were to use the same inflation calculating metrics that we had back in the 80s, well, then we're at like highest inflation we've had and ever right now. But luckily, we changed the way that we do the numbers. So now we're not. Yeah. <laughs> so before we go into that, you got to ask yourself, what is the incentive for them to change this? Is it to be just the most accurate as possible to provide the best data to all of the people to be the most honest politicians and economists that there's ever been or to protect the people that are ruling over you at all times so you don't get too mad at them. That. And so they don't have to take less money from you through taxation and so that they don't have to bump up your pay through Social Security using a cost of living adjustment. Maybe there's some incentive structure around that. Or is it just that they want to give you the most accurate number possible and that's it? And it just so happens to be that the number is a lot lower now than what it would have been if we were using the old rate. That is pure coincidence. Well, and look, this is why stats are so important and understanding how to read them and also understanding the different data points. Now, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't mean that this data is necessarily wrong, but how you calculate things is very important. And what... What they really should do is they should give you just the the data of all of it. Like, okay, if we take this into consideration, here's what inflation the inflation number is. If we, you know, adjust for quality or whatever it is, here is what it is. So I think that that's what they should be doing, and of course they're not doing that. I'm sorry, I was reading stuff in the private group. T Dub made me laugh out loud during the show. He said, "Wouldn't it be something if they send the alert before the shooting starts?" <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, man, yeah. would that be something? Now that is a bill I would get behind. Is that Minority Report? Right there. Uh, sure. Yeah. Could be. Could it's be. Minority Alert. Minority Alert. <laughs> <laughs> They've got those down in Mississippi. <laughs> okay, let's go through. So there's a website called Shadow Stats that you can go and get some of the information here. I will warn you, the rest of it's behind a hefty paywall. But the guy, the economist named John Williams, Shadow Government Statistics, and so I was just going to give you a little bit from the website before we look at some of the real rates and what it is that they changed, why they would change this, you know, and what this, what this means. What are you supposed to take away from that? So tracking changes in the cost of a fixed basket of goods was the approach to eliminating them to estimating inflation going back to at least the 1700s. So we get our basket of goods. Here's the stuff that people are going to buy. Prior to 1945, the fixed basket, CPI, tracked by the government, was known as the cost of living index. In the first half of the 20th century, the concept of a constant level of satisfaction evolved in academia. The general argument was that changing relative cost of goods would result in consumer substitution of less expensive goods for more expensive goods. Now, so, does that actually happen? Sure, it does. You know, substitute goods like I, I probably bought cheaper paper towels than what I was gonna buy. You know, when my when my budget is lower, but some of the substitutions they do are uh, ridiculous. We'll I guess I, I mean I guess that is the case for some things. However, like some people, like my wife, like she is loyal to Publix mm -hmm. and Publix only. However, she does like like Kroger's ice cream sandwiches, the Kroger brand ice cream sandwiches. Interesting. So it's like she, I don't think it matters whether she was living in a box or a mansion. Like that's like, that's what she would do. Mm -hmm. So does it actually, I mean, if you use Crest toothpaste, are you all going to sudden just switch to something that just says toothpaste on it? It's, it, it's <laughs> possible. Mean, that is the argument that they are making. Well, and that I, is what I'm saying is examples. where did they get that from? Like well, what data showed them that that's what people do? I think there is some substitution that people do. And some of the substitutions they do, I think, are possible. And some of them are ridiculous. For instance, if beef gets too expensive, they calculate that you will switch to chicken. That's different. I don't think that's... No. So, they're the, you know what this per person wanted to eat? Meat. That's what it was. They're not going to buy They're not going to buy beef. 
I just guess. any meat, any animal. Give me, the, give me a dead animal. <laughs> I'll require a dead animal tonight. Can I get the mix? <laughs> That's cheaper, right? The so the con the constant level of satisfaction. Now they're deciding that you are satisfied by the way of substituting to a lower level product, but the constant level of satisfaction approach was contrary to the concept of measuring the cost of maintaining the same standard of living. In the extreme current circumstance where the average household cannot stay ahead of even official CPI, consider that shifting household preferences from more expensive to less expensive products is forced by limited income or having to shift consumption patterns just to cover necessities. So that's the other thing. If you are being forced because of this inflation to switch to substitute to something else, isn't that a worthwhile metric that you would want to know? Right. In this case, no. You said, right, the answer is no. You don't want to know that. Okay. Maintaining a constant standard I mean, of living. You do want to know it, but they're not going to show you. Yeah, that is that is correct. Mm. Maintaining a constant standard of living means being able to consume the same goods in the same quantity without having to trade off living quality versus price. Now, that would make sense, that, right? That seems if like you, it would make if, sense. Wouldn't, if you had to switch from something that you've always done, mm-hmm. and you're like, well, now I can't afford that because of inflation, I'm going to switch to something else. Shouldn't that be counted? I'll give you one for standard of living, uh, the same standard of living versus this, uh, this constant satisfaction. So you're satisfying a need that you have. For instance, let me give you an example. I use a very specific toothpaste. I use Sensodyne Pronamel. Been using it for a long time. My teeth used to hurt. You know what? I use Pronamel. My teeth don't hurt. Okay. Is this an ad? This is not an ad. They are okay. not sponsoring the show. <laughs> but I use the pronamel when my teeth don't hurt. Now, sometimes I'll cheap out and I'll go get whatever the your standard Crest dollar store toothpaste is. And I use that for a bit. You know what ends up happening? My teeth kind of hurt. But I satisfied a need. The need was I needed to brush my teeth. And so the need was satisfied. But Regardless do I, of the outcome. But do I still have the same standard of living that I had beforehand? Because the pro enamel got too expensive, I switched to the really cheap Crest toothpaste. My tooth hurts, and but I did get to brush my teeth. Therefore, the Fed says that I have the same satisfaction mm. by doing that. So there's your Which difference. It's incorrect. Mm. Okay, so the way so this is the way that politicians won it. By the way, in the early 1990s, <laughs> Washington. Jeff says that's the same toothpaste Hunter Biden uses. <laughs> <laughs> the contention. So Is they that were, correlation? Mm, I don't know. We might have to dig into it. In the 1990s, Washington, they want to change the nature of the CPI. The contention was that the CPI was overstating inflation. And it did not allow the substitution of less expensive hamburger for more expensive steak. <laughs> Meaning my, my ribeye got too expensive. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make a, a burger patty. Steak. On the grill, same thing. I'm going to douse it in A1, and it's just like having a steak. My need my that was satisfied was that I wanted a cow to be sacrificed for my meal tonight, and I satisfied that need. Therefore, nothing changed. And so that's the system that we basically use right now. Both sides of the aisle and the financial media touted the benefits of a, quote, more accurate, unquote, CPI, one that would allow the substitution of goods and services, The plan was to reduce the cost of living adjustments for government payments to Social Security recipients. The cuts in reported inflation were an effort to reduce the federal deficit without anyone in Congress having to do the politically impossible to vote against Social Security. Mm. Alan Greenspan said, Economists believe one of the most important CPI upside biases is when consumers shift their buying patterns in response to changing prices, substituting one product for another. For example, if the price of an item like steak gets too expensive, consumers may switch to hamburger. Okay, so that is the system that we use right now. I will I will pose this the question. The hamburger system. The hamburger system, of course. Yeah. We switched from the steak system to the ham Now ask yourself, if I were going to switch to the steak from the steak system to the hamburger system, did you improve? Well, you satisfied your need, which was beef. Mm. So you got it. If I went to you and I said, you can, hey, you can have a steak or a hamburger, no cost to you, which one would you choose? I would uh, pick a steak, please. Mm. What yeah. would your wife choose? 
corn. <laughs> I don't know. Do they so, measure that when vegetarians switch from the plants get too expensive, I'm, they go to beef? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if they do or not. So just a few examples Is that the here. same standard of living? <laughs> if, uh, if a ribeye gets too expensive, you'll switch to a sirloin. Therefore, you don't need to change the calculation. If the sirloin gets too expensive, you know what? You can just switch the chicken. That's that's fine. Meat is meat. Dead animals, only thing that's required. If your toothpaste gets too expensive, my pro enamel, then you'll switch to the run-of-the-mill crest. Even if a Honda gets too expensive, you'll just switch to a Kia. If a Mac gets too expensive, you'll just get a Chromebook. Same thing. And then another big thing that they did in these numbers was they stopped calculating the cost of a house. Buying a house. Buying a home is no longer in the number. And... Thank God for the politicians that that is no longer in the number. That would have been a bleep show. All right. And so what they did now is they do the rent. Or if you have a house, what would you have to pay to rent your house in this neighborhood? Problem with that is they'll look at some of the other rents that people are paying in the neighborhood. And they will not differentiate whether or not those people have been in a lease for a long time. And so their price might not have moved up. For a few years right. or whatever it was. They don't even do market rent. They don't do the current market rent. They will use stuff in your neighborhood even if people have been locked in at the same price for a while. So um, we'll pose the question again. Is the inflation number that we have right now accurate? No. No, it is not. It's almost double. So here's what this chart looks like. The red line is the current CPI number that we use. The one that we got yesterday hit 9.1. And according to economist John Williams, where we're sitting at right now, I would guess around 17.5, something like that, 17.5. Now that is different. You could look into some of these numbers and you could just see uh, what they've done here. By the way, like on shelter, when they talk about rent, here's the year over year number for rent in the CPI that just came out yesterday, year-over-year year number, 5.9% inflation. Does anyone think that rent, 5.9% inflation year-over-year? Year? Mm. No, you go through all this stuff here. What's the highest thing? Lodging away from home. Okay, so we got that. Other lodging away from home. So those are showing 9 and 10%. Do you think your hotels and your Airbnb, all that stuff just went up 9 or 10% year-over-year? Is that the actual number that you're looking at? No, that's probably not the case. So when you actually start looking at some of these other people that are putting out numbers on the rent index or whatever, then you've actually got year-over-year year numbers sitting at 20.4%. Jesus. That's from advisorperspectives.com, 20.4% uh, national That's four index. four times the reported number in CPI, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Four times. Now, so that is, let's see, was this the actual rent or actually, sorry, this is not rent. This is buying a home. They, they say that here's the rent number right there. Medium rent year over year. They're saying is uh, 15 to 16% right now. Oh, three times. Sorry. Yeah. Get your the numbers rent's right. Three times. Get your numbers right now. I'm pulled from a bunch of different places, by the way. Now we're talking about other rent increases. And this person says that it's 27.9 one year growth in rent. Uh, versus the same time last year. This is from Dwellsy. I don't know who Dwellsy is, but they talk about dwellings mm. a lot from what I can gather. So the, the why would they do this, Charles? Well, because it benefits them. That's how, why. How so? Well, it, when it comes to retirement payments, if you worked for the government, because they don't have to do that cost of living adjustment, they only have to do, you know, according to the CPI, the new CPI, not the old one. Mm-hmm. Uh, they don't have to do uh, so. They don't have to increase Social Security payments. They don't have to uh, increase. Oh, and to top this all off, the big one is when it comes to tax brackets. That's a big one. They don't have to adjust the amount of money they're stealing from you. They don't have to adjust fact, those tax brackets up as fast. You get caught into the a higher tax bracket a lot earlier because they're not using a real CPI number mm -hmm. to adjust the brackets. Which then brings your purchasing power even lower. And mm -hmm. this is what we talk about. The reason why inflation is so bad is because the value of your purchasing power drastically decreases, and no one, literally no one, actually keeps up with it. Most corporations are going to give you an, like a 2 to 3% raise per year. Mm -hmm. 
And the problem is when you look at the original chart, you're, you've been getting two or 3% every year. And the reason why real wages haven't gone up is because it's actually been hovering between five to 10%, uh, sometimes 12. Yeah. It's been sitting right. Yeah. Right. Seven to 10%, I would say is pretty normal. So you've been losing every single year. And that like, when, when the left, let's talk about this. When the left talks about the wage gap or, or the wealth gap widening, it is true. It is true. The rich are getting richer because they typically see the money first, right? So it doesn't, the inflation doesn't affect them as much. Um, and the poor are getting poorer. And the middle class, is, middle class is shrinking in that direction as well. So that's not, it's not necessarily wrong in that analysis when you feel like the wealth gap is widening. However, a lot of the middle class shrinking number, by the way, are people moving up into the upper class. It's so about the, the, eh, the number shrinks. It's kind of both. <clears throat> They're going back and forth yeah. because, well, when you take into consideration like actual cost of living, right? I mean, making a hundred thousand dollars a year now is not like what it was twenty years ago. Definitely not. You know, you're basically like you're considered, well. Even making four, let's say you're part of the top 1% making $400,000 a year. Making $400,000 a year right now is not near the same as it was 20 years ago. I mean, 20 years ago, you would have felt probably pretty rich. Now you're like, uh, I'm not living paycheck to paycheck, but there's other things I want to do that I can't. <laughs> probably a lot of people are living paycheck to paycheck, making that amount. Oh, there are. I'm yeah. sure. It's uh, not well, those, that hard to are, do. Those are, I forget what they're called. They're high income earners. Whatever. We've gone over this before, and I always forget what the acronym is. Uh, but anyway, that like that's why I think I'm not saying that the, the middle class isn't shrinking in essence of like they're not getting richer. But when you when you move them, when you have a an arbitrary number of the middle class and it's not adjusting for true inflation, well, they're technically getting poorer based on the purchasing power. And that's why people feel that way, by the way. So we can actually back up their feelings with real data and but point you to the actual problem which Ron Paul tweeted about uh, not that long ago, which this all started in 1913. Mm-hmm. 1913, worst year. Worst, worst year. year ever. Income tax, the Fed. <clears throat> That's horrible. Mm-hmm. Okay, so uh, the I other thing. If I big... went back to 1913, I wouldn't even go try to kill Hitler. <laughs> I would stop the Fed and income tax from passing. Oh, man. Which means Hitler probably wouldn't have risen up anyway. You think anyone's ever going to go back in time and kill Hitler? No. Good. I'm glad you said that. Because you can't. I always have this conversation with Lacey. She's like, "Well, you know, we don't we don't know that." I'm like, "Did it, I'm like, hey, did Hitler exist?" She's like, "Yeah." I'm like, "Then we know no one went back in time and killed him, even if they're not gonna. Maybe they go back in time a hundred years from now. We wouldn't. We, there wouldn't be any Hitler right now. It, at least in my understanding of things that aren't real. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyhow." Uh, the other, the big thing is Social Security, by the way. We spend uh, like $1.2 trillion a year paying out Social Security. And they did a big uh, increase this year because of the inflation. It was 5.9%, the cost of living adjustment. So 1.3% adjustment for 2021, 1.6 in 2020. That's the highest adjustment they've done in the last 40 years reflects rising prices due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm. Man. And 5.9% doesn't even get you where we're No, that's still not it. It's it's still not enough. And just imagine what they would have had to do with their Social Security payout every year since the time that they changed this. And they used to have it, actually, where you didn't make any change unless it was over 3%. So 2.9% every year, they don't have to make an adjustment. 2.9% every year, they don't have to make an adjustment. They got rid of that. And I, I think this is one of those things we've gotten into. We know that we can't afford to actually increase Social Security benefits with the actual rate of inflation anymore. It's just it's just not possible. We've got a bunch of people living on this idea that somehow we're going to continue to have enough money from the government to pay them. And we're just going to be a dog chasing our tail here. We're going to keep printing more money, sending prices up. Then we got to do inflation adjustments for everyone. Then that's not enough. We use fake money to do all to pay out all the benefits. Prices go up. We do more inflation adjustments. We use fake money to pay out the adjustments. That's, I don't, that's, it's not going to, this dog don't float. It's a scheme. It is. Mm-hmm. It is a scheme. A Ponzi, mm-hmm. like a Ponzi scheme. Okay. Just a dog chasing colors. So there you go. There's your, your bright news 
Uh, what would you tell people to take away from that, other than the fact that the government are just a bunch of liars and all they care about is getting reelected and they want to make sure that they don't make you any more mad than you already are? Um, anything else? The best thing that you can do personally for yourself is to uh, what Jason Stapleton would call would be increase your human capital is to create. No, well, maybe not create, but adopt the most amount of valuable skills that you possibly can adopt mm -hmm. and um, and then live as high as you can. High living, <laughs> not like high as in like the, the status of your psychology. But high is in like Milton Friedman. The only answer to high inflation is high living because right. things, things are going to be worth less, but more dollars. Spend it right now. Spend it now. And that thing will be worth more later. I made a good investment, by the way. My table finally showed up. I bought that thing back in January. My table just got here yesterday. I bought it in January. First time having a dining room table in our dining room, in our house. It's just been a big empty room with like boxes and junk and stuff in it. And now we got this and I feel like it was a pretty good investment, you know, because I paid January prices for that thing. And so now here it is arriving in July price and that thing's gone up pretty good amount. Now I'm sure the fed would tell me it went up by like 0.3% or something like that. Mm -hmm. But from what I can tell, it's about 15% that it's gone up. So anyway, I bought a house. Well, I agreed to buy a house for a certain amount in August of 2021 and I just moved in, like the house just finished three weeks ago, and it's already worth almost 50% more. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, inflation's only 9%. Of course it is. That's it. So. Okay. That's the other, you know, is we have the, you, we're talking about the wealth, the wealth gap. Obviously, uh, someone owning the home, that's a big portion of their wealth, of course. That's like for, for most. For most people. Normal mm -hmm. people, that's going to be the source of what their wealth is. And so they take the cost of buying a new home out of the inflation number. It's, it's just gone. And people mm -hmm. wonder, like, oh, this doesn't seem to make any sense. What's going on right now? That's because the actual inflation number would be freaking 20% right now. And in this case, the facts do care about your feelings. They do. Because <laughs> <clears throat> what you're feeling is actually backed up by facts. And the whole problem is government. Speaking of mo plenty of money that we have that we can just throw wherever we want. No problem at all. This next article from Ben. Well I, well, I wanted to touch real quick based on or, or like what can we actually do about this? Well, we told you yesterday that the real solution is a hard sell. And, you know, I can't quite figure out how to ar actually articulate the message of this hard sell to where it actually sounds good to people. So I think I think as libertarians, one thing we need to work on is how do we actually tell people that, you know, withdrawing from drugs is a good thing. <laughs> like, how do you, like, how do you paint that picture of like what life could be like? I think that's the most difficult thing. And by golly, I don't think anybody's figured it out. I know that's because the real answer is, is obviously to basically reduce everything as much as you possibly can and then let the market work. But that's going to cause pain and people don't like that. It's going to hurt. But the, the problem is the pain's coming whether we like it or not. It like, in fact, it's here right now. People are experiencing real pain, but they want people to do something. They want other people to do something like take action and the real action is no action. I can't quite figure that out. So the only thing I really know what to tell people to do is personally to try and increase valuable skills as much as you possibly can. Try and beat the inflation. If you ever thought about going into software development, now's a good time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's it's free. By the way, it's like 97% of people won't take advantage of it though, but it is free to go out there and learn just about anything and you can come out of you can come out of getting a Google certificate making like 160 grand a year. So, you know, like those are the types of things like skills that you want to take on because as this gets worse, of course you're going to want to have a valuable skill that you can employ in the market that's actually going to rise with the cost of inflation. So, you look at a lot of these developers out there making half a million dollars a year, you know, back in when computers first came around, they were making, you know, fifty, sixty, hundred thousand dollars a year. So that's one wage that's actually increased with inflation. You basically have the same purchasing power as an engineer as you did twenty, thirty years ago. So and Charlie was talking about withdrawing, uh, what we're gonna go through. And here's part of the problem. Let's bring up this chart. This is the Fed's balance sheet. 
So you can see this big this big bump up right here. This is the COVID pandemic. Uh, this is when they injected about four to five trillion, about four trillion, like right off the bat, they stuck that in there. Um, the balance sheet was all the way down here uh, under a trillion as of like 2008. We get our 2009, uh, 2008 crisis. They increased their balance sheet. So that's them making new money, buying up bonds, buying up assets, doing whatever it is they do with all that. And it just keeps increasing, keeps increasing. Now this area right here, this in the stock market, this is known as the taper tantrum. This is the little stock market downturn that we had in 2018, where it went down like 20% or so. And you're like, what happened in 2018? Well, the reason the market fell down so much in 2018 was because that's when the Fed said, okay, we need to decrease our balance sheet a little bit. And that lasted for all of two years before they just totally blew that back out of the water. And people couldn't handle the pain of going through that because we're so heavily inflated with this fake money that we've got out there. And so when you go through the pain, the problem is, you know, for a drug addict, you can say, this isn't going to, this isn't going to end well. Like, you're going to, you're going to die. You're going to end up overdosing. All right. That's going to happen. And you can kind of scare someone into it, you know, but it's a lot harder when it comes to what we've been doing with our finances, because we've been doing this for a while and we could probably just keep, just keep going for a while. I don't know when it's going to crash. You know, I, I have no proof that the U S government is just going to totally collapse and our financial system is going to collapse. You know, I don't think that's going to happen. So I guess I'll just I'm keep, sure, I sure, I'm sure Sri Lanka <clears> thought, <throat> thought the same. Thing. I'll just keep going through my life the way it is right now. You know, I'm, I can probably make it my whole life and screw my kids. You want me to worry about my kids? Come on, man. I need a car. I don't even have any kids. I need a car and a house. Jeez. And so it's, it's a tough sell. And I think anyone who tries to do it is going to have a really tough time winding that down. So good luck, Dave Smith, when you get to it. <laughs> All right, Charles. All right. This from the Daily Wire, next story. Uh, in case, God, you know, the problem is actually we haven't spent enough money. Mm -hmm. So um, from the Daily Wire, the U.S. announces another round of $1.7 billion in aid to Ukraine. <clears throat> you means you. It's your crane. <laughs> the United States government and the World Bank are sending a combined $1.7 billion in assistance to the Ukrainian government in an effort to sp support health care workers in the war-torn nation. <laughs> On Tuesday, the Associated Press reported that the U.S. US Agency for International Development announced that the funds were being provided to help stop Russian President Vladimir Putin's brutal war of aggression. USAID Administrator Samantha Power told the AP that while Putin's assault, quote, assault on Ukraine's public service continues, the United States is rushing in with financial support to help the government keep the lights on, provide essential services to innocent uh, citizens, and pay the health care workers who are providing life-saving support <laughs> On the front lines. When did th when did this become the thing that like we are supposed to pay for? How is this so easy to sell to everyone? And so, as someone in like live uh, in the live group put it, it's our crane. You need to call it we crane. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. How how is it so easy that people just accept? This like, oh, well, you know, healthcare workers in Ukraine, they need to get paid for the stuff they're doing. Give me your money. It's in support of democracy <laughs> versus evil. God. This is good versus evil. What, did anyone ever think about Ukraine before this whole, like, they just woke up in the morning in January 2022. They're like, oh, thank God. My life sucks, you know, taxes and inflation and, and all this other, but we still have Ukraine. Just every day they wake up. Oh God, we still got Ukraine. Now, how much of that money do you think is actually going to go to like the healthcare workers? God, about as much. Time, about as much it, went to building houses in Haiti. I would say. By the time it gets to them, this is the biggest. It, if anyone is ever able to pull the receipts on this, ten years from now, we're going to be laughing about this situation where, oh yeah, I remember we gave all that money to Ukraine and like five billion of it went to actually helping Ukraine. Just like how we say, oh, yeah, the Clinton Foundation helping Haiti. Ha, 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 ha. No, there's a bunch of people getting rich off of this. 
Of course there are. Of course there are. Mm -hmm. It's not even a question. This money definitely goes through contractors, by the way. Yes. To be distributed. We're charging 80 times the amount that they would normally charge because the U.S. government apparently just has plenty of our money that they want to give out to it. And then we're like, oh, well, well, it's not that much. Not that much. Well, we're not really going to raise taxes to do this. Yeah, we're all complaining about inflation right now. People act like you're going to be able to give it to them and we're not going to have to pay for it. Someone's got to pay for it. Inflation is a tax. All right, Treasury Secretary Janet Jelen also said in a statement that this new round of aid, quote, will help Ukraine's democratic government provide essential services for the people of Ukraine. See, that's the thing, Nate. It's about democracy. Yeah. Okay? And if we don't help out a country who is democratic, then we're allowing tyranny to win. Don't you want to do everything you can to stop tyranny? For his part, President Joe Biden has maintained that the U.S. will continue to support Ukraine through various measures indefinitely in order to defeat Russia. Quote, we are going to support Ukraine as long as it takes, Biden told reporters. As long as it takes, folks. Doesn't matter what's happening to you. There's no limit to the amount of money. Mm. No limit to the amount of time or money that we're going to spend on this. Quote, they've had to, is that re-engage? Renege. Okay, it's They've had to renege on their national debt for the first time since the beginning in almost well over 100 years. Hold on, read that again. <laughs> They've had to renege on their national debt for the first time since the beginning in almost well over 100 years. <laughs> first time since the, be- still? Yeah, since the still. beginning in almost well over 100 years. Uh, Ukraine hasn't even been a country we for almost, 100 years. I don't even care about that. I'm trying to figure out what almost well over something is. <laughs> like, ah, oh, we're just over it. I wouldn't say we're well over it, though. We're almost well over it. Yeah. <laughs> for the first time since the beginning, almost well over 100 years, you know the thing. Yeah. They're going to have trouble maintaining oil production because they don't have the technology to do it. They need American technology. They're also in a similar uh, satiation in terms <laughs> It does say satiation. It does. <laughs> yeah. In terms of their weapons systems and some of their military systems. So they're paying a very, very heavy price for this. Yeah, because China doesn't exist. Mm. They have to have American oil producers helping them with technology. China doesn't have any technology. I don't know how it's going to end, but it will not end. But it will not end with a Russian defeat of Ukraine in Ukraine. The president has also said Americans should expect to pay high gas prices until Russia is defeated. In June, a reporter asked Biden, how long is it fair to expect American drivers and drivers around the world to pay that premium for this world war? And Biden said, we already covered this, as long as it takes. Because, you know, what's more important, you yeah. or Ukraine? Obviously, Ukraine. Now, look, that doesn't mean that we don't have any sympathy or empathy for Ukrainians whatsoever. We hate war. I'm totally against it. But you should let people sort out their own issues. We don't have to be the defenders of so-called freedom, which has not been the case. And I'm just like, I'm so sick of this. We... If we had the money, maybe we could argue about whether or not we could send aid. Like mm-hmm. That could be up for debate. Yeah. But the truth is, we don't have it. We, we, there's none. It doesn't exist. Now, do we get to obtain some type of ownership of Ukraine after this, you think? They're going to pay it back later I think, on? I think the problem is we already have ownership of Ukraine. <laughs> that might be some of the so issues. That's why we're probably yeah. involved. I guess so. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, anyway. But that's not the craziest thing that's happening, Nate. No. The craziest thing, as you all will remember that we need to remind you of daily is the worst day in world history, Jan 6. You don't have to remind anyone about that. I got January 6th. I mean, like we're required to talk about it. Yes. As podcasters Mm -hmm. to make sure people never forget. Followed closely by the day that Russia invaded Ukraine and everyone's hearts, of course. But January 6th totally Mm -hmm. takes that. Even people in Sri Lanka are like, God, do you guys remember January 6th? That was crazy. Yeah. That was nuts. Okay, so (laughs) the New York Times... Put out this great piece. Actually, can, um, can we have a moment of silence for Jan 6 since mm-hmm. we mentioned it? One second. Okay. All right. That was good. <laughs> See, we do care. H. All right. It's just been hell from the New York Times here. Life 
as the victim of a January 6th conspiracy theory. Life as the victim of a January 6th conspiracy theory. Now, they are talking about the one and only Ray Epps. Ray Epps, as you might remember, is the guy who's definitely not a Fed, who was trying to get people to go into the Capitol. All right. Big Trump supporter. Stole an election. Trying to get people to go into the Capitol. But since... New York Times wants to talk about January 6th. They've now portrayed Ray Epps as a victim, even though he literally was out there trying to get people to storm the Capitol. He is a victim now in the eyes of the New York Times from even worse people who are the January 6th conspiracy theorists, the people who think that it was possible that Ray Epps was uh, somehow working with the government. I'm not saying he, he was working with the government. We talked about it several times. I mean, we said we had no idea. Mm. It's just, it's been kind of weird. We couldn't find no hide, no hair of the lady. No. So, up a winding country road in a trailer park, a half mile from a cattle ranch, lives a man whose life has been ruined by a January 6th conspiracy theory. <laughs> Ray Epps. <laughs> Has suffered enormously. That's pretty good. He's suffered enormously in the past 10 months as the right-wing media figures and the Republican politicians have baselessly described him as a covert government agent who helped to instigate the attack on the Capitol last year. Quote, and for what? Lies? Mr. Epps asked. All of this, it's just been hell. Almost from the moment that a violent mob stormed the Capitol on J-6, allies of President Donald J. Trump have sought to shift the blame for the attack away from the people who were in the pro-Trump crowd that day to any number of scapegoats. They tried Antifa. Including Ray Epps. Including Ray Epps, who was in the crowd. Anyway. Did he ever get arrested? No, no. That's, no, okay. Okay, so they tried to do this. Mr. Epps was not just a bystander. He traveled to Washington to back Mr. Trump, was taped urging people to go to the Capitol, and was there himself on the day of the assault. But through a series of events that twisted his role, he became the face of this conspiracy theory about the FBI as it spread from the fringes to the mainstream. Revolver News used selectively edited videos and unfounded leaps of logic very concerned about unfounded leaps of logic in the New York Times, to paint him as a secret federal asset in charge of a breach team responsible for setting off the riot at the Capitol. The stories about Mr. Epps were quickly seized on by Tucker Carlson, who gave them a wider audience. They were also echoed by Republican members like Thomas Nazi of Ken- Massey of Kentucky and Senator, Senator Tedward Cruz of Texas. I don't know why, just... Screw it, you know. It's hard to say these evil people's names. I know. I get it. Yeah, I get them, get them wrong sometimes. You're so holy that when the evil comes out of your mouth, you, you, you tremble. It's laughable, mm-hmm. really. Mr. Epps and his wife have been searching for a lawyer to help them file a defamation lawsuit against several of the people. Now, this is where I'm like, okay, okay. Maybe the guy's not a Fed. I get it. He's not a Fed. Totally not a Fed. Let's and, assume he's not a Fed. <clears throat> let's assume just, he's not a Fed. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Reps, this like one of the most popular people from the January 6th riots and insurrection and conspiracy theory. He was on tape inciting people to go in. Name dragged through the mud by everyone you can possibly think about. Joe Rogan, Tucker Carlson, all kinds of people. Mr. Reps and his wife have been searching for a lawyer to help them file a defamation lawsuit against several of the people who have spread the false accounts. Searching. Can't find one. That's been their biggest issue. That is where, okay, I'm not saying he's a Fed. That's not what I'm saying, but isn't that's kind of weird. They're just looking. They can't find a lawyer to help them sue, like, the biggest media organizations yeah. in the world. Yeah, Can't find it. Which is insane. We should call Kyle Rittenhouse. Like you know? Lawyers would be crawling out of the woodwork to take there's, this case. There's a bunch of lawyers who are victims because they can't find Mr. Reps. They've been trying to give him money this whole time. But anyway, they can't find a lawyer. They've been looking this whole time since January 6th of 2021. They've been looking, still can't find. Once they get the lawyer, then they're going to move towards the then suit. Then the truth will come out. Then the truth will come out. Mr. Epps said the truth needs to come out. While Mr. Epps was a participant in some of the events that unfolded, he was mostly not. <laughs> Kidding. 
The claim that he inspired the Capitol riot in a false flag plot is solely based on the fact that he was never arrested and therefore must be under protection. But scores, if not hundreds, of people who appear to have committed minor crimes that day were investigated by the FBI, but were not charged or taken into custody. He said that he acted stupidly at times when he and one of his sons took a last-minute trip to Washington, but he said that he managed to avoid arrest because he reached out to the FBI within minutes of discovering that they wanted to speak with him. That's what was wrong with the other people. They, they just wanted the phone call. Yeah. Like, hey. They want you to phone in. <laughs> call. If you call phone them. in, you won't be arrested. That's how usually crimes They're like, work. We are looking for Ray yeah. Epps because he broke the law, and he calls in and he says, yeah. hey, I'm Ray Epps. And they're like, oh, okay, cool. Everything's fine. Yeah. <laughs> hey, FBI, I just robbed this bank. Just wanted to call and let you know. Well, thanks for calling. Thank you. We'll take your name off the list. We'll t- <laughs> <laughs> That's how crimes work. That's how it goes. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why you guys didn't know this. As long as you call in, everything's right. fine. One of the moments Mr. Epps regrets most from his stay is when he joined his son and a friend for the Trump rally at the Black Lives Matter Plaza. During the event, he was videotaped by a right-wing provocateur encouraging people to go inside the Capitol on January 6th. Now, let me get this straight. Ray Epps has been so victimized by the people that are oh, worse than Hang him. on, you got to finish that. Okay. And what he described as a form of peaceful protest. Yes. So. He's been so victimized by all these terrible evil people that now he is a victim in the eyes of the New York Times that when he was videotaped encouraging people to go inside the Capitol yet peacefully they called the person who taped him a right-wing provocateur now just to get this straight one more time the right-wing provocateur taped him telling the crowd that they needed to go inside the Capitol in protest it's obviously the provocateur's (laughs) fault for videotaping yes that is the bad person Glad we got that right. Because he thought that if he didn't say something, that the provocateur would probably shoot him. It was under threat. It was under threat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was threatened into inciting the erection. The clip has been used to depict Mr. Epps as a man who not only urged people to riot at the Capitol, but then evaded prosecution. Depict. (laughs) Not that it actually happened. Mm -mm. This is depicting. The Justice Department has not publicly addressed its decision to not charge him, but the legal definition of incitement requires a person's words to cause an immediate threat of danger, not one that could possibly occur the following day. I'm just, I'm glad to know that they know what the legal definition of incitement is. Yeah. That's good to know that in this case, they know. You know who is guilty of incitement? That Trump guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When, he told people to go to the Capitol and peacefully. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, when he told people to go home. Yeah, that one too. To stay peaceful. Mr. Epps also said he regretted sending a text to his nephew well after the violence had erupted in which he discussed how he helped orchestrate the movements of people who were leaving the speech and telling them to go down to the Capitol. <laughs> he regrets it. <laughs> Victim. He states his regret. He's apologizing. How do they write this? I don't know. Shit. I don't know. God. It's all about, like, when you get into this victims and oppressors mentality, like, they've been able to just switch Ray Epps into being a victim. Like, any other guy, by the way, any other guy who did these exact same things, they would want sitting in a jail cell right now. This can't be real. Any other person. This can't be real. This didn't really come from the New York Times. (laughs) It did. This can't. But seriously, any any other person that did the exact same things that he did, they would want them rotting in a jail cell right now. But because he was then called a government agent and the conspiracy was that it was a government agent that did this, all of the stuff that he did, which, by the way, when he wasn't a government agent, he was just a crazy Trump supporter telling people they need to storm the Capitol. All that's erased (laughs) because Tucker Carlson talked about how he could have been a Fed. The good news is, though, is he, even though he went to a restricted area of the Capitol, he didn't go into the building itself. Mm-hmm. That's good. So, okay. Yeah. They then, if you, I know that you're feeling really bad for Mr. Epps right now. Stuff's been tough, but he's also getting these clearly credible threats, extremely credible threats uh, verified here by the New York Times. 
In January, Mr. Epps received a letter from someone claiming to have been brought into the country by a Mexican drug cartel. The writer said he overheard some cartel members talking about killing Mr. Epps. The, the writer said, I write on paper to tell you, you need to be look out. Need to be look out, the letter said in broken English. The drug gang people, very bad people. Mm, yeah. Now, I know that there are tons of incentives for people to cross the border illegally, but I never considered how big one of them would be would be killing Ray Epps. Mm. Like, that's a big yep. one right there, and that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. to, to leave the hellhole that you're in, whatever country it is. For justice. <laughs> to, <laughs> to kill the feds, because God yeah. hates feds. Mm. And so they're doing the Lord's work. Okay, anyway, ultimately... Just said things have gotten bad. The couple sold their businesses and their ranch-style house, losing hundreds of thousands of dollars and wrecking the arrangements they had made for their retirement. They just can't find that lawyer. <laughs> that's the problem. While he wants to clear his name, he's under no illusion that that's going to happen. He says, you can convince some people, but there are extremists out there that you'll never convince them that they're wrong. Says uh, the guy that was out there telling people to storm the Capitol because he is... said the election was stolen. Absolutely nuts. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. nuts. It it just shows you that the the very loud woke left will go to the extremes. The like far reaching extremes that you could like you thought the other things were were impossible. They they're they're always in this exchange of hold my beer as time goes on. It's like Almost like they're trying to one up each other on the craziness that they can see that they like, how much can we actually get away with? Well, there's always how, like, will my editor and publisher actually publish this story if I write it? You think the writer there's of like this a is, bet under the table exactly to see if they'll actually around, publish it? See it sit around and be like, I can't believe you got that one. Okay, I'm gonna call Ray Epps a victim. Here's, here's your hundred bucks. <laughs> 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 they're all cheering. Oh. So when you view everything in this oppressor and victim, we talk about the pyramid or the totem pole or whatever it is. Remember, there's always someone that's more victimized than someone else. There's always someone that's got it better than someone else and that the, you've got your oppressor. And, and eventually, every single person underneath that totem pole can either be a victim or they could also be an oppressor of someone else the whole time. But there's just someone at the top of the totem pole. These days, it's Trump. Now, it is switching to being Ron DeSantis. I saw that mm. Nina Turner. 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 <laughs> Dina Turner. I saw uh, Nina Turd. I always want to call her Tina Turner, but it's Nina Turner. I saw her say, tweeted the other day, that uh, Ron DeSantis is more dangerous than Donald Trump. So it's happening. It's starting. Yeah. And so that's happening. So he's climbing the totem pole. He's working working his way up the pole <laughs> right now and climbing I'm up over Trump. I'm surprised they haven't asked if they can impeach him before he gets into the office. <laughs> Might as well go <laughs> ahead and do it. They impeached Trump after he was out of office. I mean, well, let's go ahead and impeach DeSantis right now. Gosh. Okay, it's late. Let's go home. Well, that's your Insanity Thursday. Mm. If you enjoyed today's episode, please hit that follow or like button, whatever it is, on your podcasting app that you listen to. Uh, for most, it's just that little plus sign in the top right-hand corner. Please hit it right now. Thank you. That was so nice of you. I just love when you folks are kind to us, mm -hmm. and you are, and we appreciate that very much. Nate loves the praise. Please send him an email, nate at goodmorningliberty.us. Let him know how handsome he is and how wonderful he does every single day of the week bringing you guys the best liberty news there is out there. About to be bringing people some merch. And merch. I'm excited to hear. About to the, do a merch drop. I'm excited to hear the feedback on our new line of God Hates Feds clothing that's going to be coming out. And it better be good. I hope the feedback is good. We've also got a, a uh, Joe Biden puzzle mm. that people are going to be able to to solve. One that so you can give good. your kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's great. It's great for that. Yeah. So working on working on a lot of different things. I, yeah. I pre-released some of it to the group earlier today, but there's a few more. That are happening right now, too. I'm pumped. Are we going to do an early drop to the live group with a discount? They're probably live group people will get a will get some kind of discount. They'll get the first stab mm -hmm. at the merch store with a discount. Yep. So if you want that, you better go sign up. Join gml.com. Join gml.com. Sign up. Be part of the live show. Be part of the Discord group. 
there's more than just the live show. There's people sharing ideas. We got all kinds of things taking place there. So be part of this of uh, this community. Um, it's a lot of fun. Join gml.com. You get some perks. You get a little bit of pre-show. You get a little bit of post-show. <laughs> I can't even do it. <laughs> and that's the bottom line. Oh, anyway. Hell yeah. <laughs> all right. And uh, if you do all those things, we'll be back again tomorrow for some dumb bleep of the week. Hope you guys have a good day and a good morning liberty.